So good day. So we get to talk about this today. Uh, and the subject is going to be weeds. Uh, and uh, just to make things clear and to define weeds, uh, a weed can be defined as a, an unwanted plant, or as uh, often I like to say, it's an unloved plant. Because potentially every single plant can at one point or another become a weed. Uh, most uh, acceptable definition is that a weed is a plant that interferes with the usage of the area, which means that if there is a garden that has a lot of roses and uh, there happens to be a tulip that decides to come out from the ground, it should be a weed because uh, it is doesn't belong in a rose garden uh, and vice versa. So keep that in mind because as we are going to be looking at other plants, uh, weeds are going to become a problem or there may be a problem in the garden. Uh, another thing that you have to consider, like the image that you see here where you have a weed that is going out of uh, the cement, uh, a newly uh, layer of uh, asphalt or tarmac uh, that was laid on campus and all of a sudden you have uh, plants that are bursting uh, from underneath. Uh, so you wonder why is it possible that some of these plants can do this? Why is it possible that I see plants in the middle of nowhere with no care, no culture, nobody's taking care of them and do, they're doing very well. The reason for is that a lot of the plants that we consider weeds uh, were at one point perhaps cultivated by people or selected for food, but as new selections came out, they kind of got abandoned and they still are making a living out there, uh, kind of sharing some of the water, vitamin, minerals, sunlight, uh, some of the cultivated plants. So they tend to be kind of a relationship between the cultivated plants and the one that we consider weed. Uh, so the weed plants that are not uh, inbred, so they still have a lot of wild genes, and those wild genes allow them allow them to resist resist diseases, resist uh, uh, stress. Anybody, they just they're very very happy. So keep that in mind. Uh, so here's some examples of uh, weeds. I'm going to refer to them. Yeah, just a second down. That is over on uh, our Bermuda buttercup or in Axalis. Uh, so obviously it was never intended to be an Axalis garden, but the Axalis is coming up everywhere. So the Axalis will be a weed. And uh, that is, is a photograph of uh, this uh, specific plant, the axalis. Uh, here is a uh, uh, wood soil as well as the buttercup kind of mix. Uh, here we have a succulent garden, and uh, we have eoniums. And as you can see, in different areas where there is some space, there is a unwanted plant a weed that is coming up. Uh, be aware that if there is a space that it has light, it has water, there's soil, nature wants to put something there, whether it be a desirable plant in the garden or a plant that is gonna be referred to later on as a weed. I also like to caution you as you start looking at weeds uh, because a lot of the plants consider or that were once considered weed were the California native. And that is because when people start to farm and uh, they destroyed some of the natural habitat, uh, they put the fields and naturally some of the plants that had a seed bank uh, that were California native started to come out. And uh, then because they were interfering with uh, the orchard, the almond orchard, the cherry orchard, they were labeled as weed. And uh, the best case or the best example is uh, milkweed. 
Uh, it's called milkweed because it produces milk and it was a weed in the fields. And we know that it is a very important California native monarch butterfly. But the fact that the title weed uh, is going to follow it came from the fact that it was a weed in an agriculture scenario. So that is why I will caution you uh, when you're hearing the word weed associated with some of those plants. And you make the judgment uh, whether it's a unwanted or wanted desirable plant. Uh, here is uh, another example. Uh, this is Bermuda grass, often labeled as a weed. It is a turf grass, uh, but here they took away the grass and they put artificial turf. And, and so they did not take care of the problem or the grass correctly. And you see the Bermuda grass just creeping out from uh, the edge uh, and it's gonna become a problem. So here, the old existing lawn has now become a weed in an artificial field or turf grass. And uh, this is uh, the new landscape at uh, the big uh, post office here on Redondo. And it's a drought tolerant garden. And uh, out of some of the areas where there was a new plant, there is cattails that are coming out. Uh, there's obviously a lot of water being given uh, to these plants. And so in this case, cattail witch is a California riparian water edged na native plant. Is in fact a weed in this garden, although I really like the cattail, I will get rid of everything else, but that's my personal uh, preference. Uh, so again, cattail, a native plant in this scenario would be considered the weed uh, for the landscape. And so when we look at the weeds, we are, can uh, divide them into two different categories. So we're gonna divide them into broadleaf weeds, which are often known as the dicot, or the narrow or grass uh, weeds, uh, which are gonna be the monocots. So we're gonna have monocots and dicots. Uh, there's gonna be uh, certain it is very important that you know which one you're dealing with so that you can either prevent it or hopefully deal with the problem early on. Uh, when we're also looking at the weeds, we are going to find that some of them are going to be seasonal. Uh, that means they're going to be annual and uh, they're only going to be uh, out in the landscape for one entire year. Uh, during that time, they're going to germinate from seeds. They are going to then uh, grow, flower, and uh, release a bunch of more seeds. Uh, and or you're going to be dealing with perennial type plants. Uh, perennial plants that will be uh, present for many, many years, which uh, may often have some underground structure that will make it a little bit more difficult to eradicate or deal with. Uh, from all these categories, the annual plants are going to be a lot easier to control. The perennials would be a little bit more difficult, but not entirely uh, impossible. Uh, so here on the bottom, we have the example of uh, a grass uh, and uh, a broadly uh, weed uh, that we have right here. So we have two uh, monocots, dicots, uh, grass-like broadleaf or uh, uh, narrow leaf. So the two categories, uh, and this becomes much more important when you are going to be dealing with a selective type of herbicide. So when we're dealing with weeds, we are going to use herbicides, uh, a product that is used to kill herbs or plants. And so there are products out there that are selective. So I think the most popular is a weed and feed for turf that you are going to fertilize your turf that is made out of a grass and you're going to be killing the broad leaf. Uh, and so that's very important. So as a way of controlling some of them. So here we have just a general type uh, of li uh, uh, life cycle. So we have a seed that is going to uh, germinate, uh, then it's going to grow. And as it grows, then it's going to mature and it's going to produce flowers and then it's going to set more seeds and then it's going to die. So this will occur 
in one season. It is also important for you to understand that uh, there's going to be weeds that are going to be primarily found during the winter, which is already went by. And uh, later on, as those die, uh, then they're going to be followed by the summer. So the winters are going to be uh, out there from the fall when we start getting our rain and uh, until like spring uh, and summer when it starts getting hot. So it's really hot. Uh, somewhere in the middle, there's now the germination of some of the annual plants and those will persist all the way until fall. Uh, so the temperature will play a major role. And so as you're looking for plants or as you're looking for weed problems, then you, you can, you're going to find them during the different uh, of the year. Uh, it is very important to, for you to understand that for a lot of the annual plants, one of the best ways to control them is by preventing them from actually germinating. And that is by the use of a pre emergent herbicide and I explained that at the end. So it is a product that you would put on the ground that creates a toxic layer. So as the seed germinates right about this stage and it tries to push us out of the ground, it's going to come in contact with a chemical and it's going to be killed during this stage. Uh, so summer annual plants, you can start seeing them out there. Uh, winter annuals, they're going away. Uh, and uh, there's going to be plants that will become uh, perennial. So we also have uh, biennials, so plants that may grow for two years or two seasons. So they'll start their life during uh, the spring, uh, go through fall, and then the next year they're going to uh, flower and die. So the first year is just going to be uh, vegetative growth, and then the second year is going to be followed by flowers and then seeds and then they're going to die coming back from seeds the next year. Uh, and then we have uh, plants, weeds that are going to be simple perennial like the dandelion that will be there for many, many years. Uh, dandelions and as you are now dealing with perennial weeds, they're going to be a lot more difficult to control. And that is because you would need to remove the entire portion of the plant, including the roots because many of these weeds can regrow uh, and or uh, reestablish themselves from a small piece of root that was left behind. Or as we get into even more problematic individuals, then we have the creeping perennials, plants that are going to have some kind of underground structure, either a rhizome, either a tiny bulb, either a stolen, or something that is going to allow them to creep underground where they may be protected from uh, the elements, where they're going to be protected from uh, some chemicals and you can keep pulling them out of the ground. They will continue on surviving and growing from the underground structures. So the creeping perennials are going to be the ones that are going to be a lot more difficult to deal with and to control. So here are some of those structures uh, that we may find. So we have some rhizomes, so underground stems that will continue to grow out, expand and sending out shoots. Uh, we have tubers, so tiny little uh, stems that are going to be produced by many plants. And uh, those will need to be removed entirely if you wanna move through the plant. We have some of the root segments, such as the dandelion, where you can yank or pull the leaf. Uh, the uh, roots will regenerate a new shoot system. And then we have bulbs, as in certain onions, that are going to be problematic, uh, that will happen. And then we have seeds. There is a healthy seed bank in the ground. So every single year, new seeds are dropped to the ground, and those regenerate the seed bank. And so over time, they may get buried and they're going to be alive for many years. And as soon as you till the soil, as soon as you work the soil, you bring it up closer to the surface, now taking water, and then boom, they're going to germinate. And so you wonder how did some of these plants get here? They were already there. They were just waiting for the chance, for the light, for the water, for the right environmental factors to begin to grow. And then you have some kind of stolen uh, stems that are going to be above the ground. They're going to creep, grow across the ground, 
and then they're going to root as they touch the ground. So these are just some examples of some of the modifications and some of the structures that some of these weedy plants may use that will make them a little bit more difficult to control. Uh, here's oxalis and uh, here are tiny little bulbs. So you can almost see some of them already trying to sprout some of those roots. So it's important for you to yank it out of the ground and be very careful because this entire structure is very fragile. And so if it happens to shatter and break, you can run the risk of uh, spreading it into other areas. And so that's another very important concept. Uh, many times it is through lawnmowers, many times it's through equipment that some of the weeds may move from one area to the other. So seeds will be great for annuals, but some of the perennials, uh, it will be through some of the lawnmowers equipment that was contaminated from a prior use. And so when it's brought into a new area, some of the structures may simply fall off and become established. And now you have the weed growing in your yard. So when we're dealing with the monocots or the narrow leaf, uh, we're going to have a few examples. We're going to have the sedges as in uh, nut grass or nut sedge. That is going to be a serious problem. Uh, we are going to have some rushes or rush. Uh, and then we're also going to have some of the grasses or the two true grasses. These are similar plants, but they're going to be different. Uh, best thing is there's a saying, uh, sedges have edges because when you look at the stem or you feel the stem, you will feel edges. They have triangle shapes. Uh, rushes are round. So yes, the entire uh, stem for the rush will be very round. And then uh, grasses have knees all the way to the ground. So you can see areas where the leaf comes out. If you feel or if you touch them, you can feel a bump. So there, that's a node. And so you can feel knees or joints on some of the grasses. And many of them are going to be very low to the ground. And that's what's going to allow them to survive. So be aware of the three different types of uh, narrow leaf or grass like plants that could become a problem uh, or a weedy. From this category, the nut sage is going to be one that is going to be listed as a California noxious weed. Uh, here is uh, just a field and uh, it's inundated with what is known as wild oats and uh, this was behind, behind our campus it is now the park or the parking lot for the school and it is a oats uh, that in the old days it was edible uh, and or it was used uh, grown for feeding animals it got away we no longer have a need for this grass because we california does not have cattle but the plant is now established. It comes up every single year. It is a winter type or a fall type cool season annual grass. Uh, but it's here uh, and uh, here's uh, the flowers uh, for uh, this plant and uh, the seeds or the kernel. So the actual old uh, kernel, which you would eat, uh, is embedded right here. Uh, and so those because there's no animals to eat them, simply fall to the ground, and the next year they'll sprout, germinate, come up, and become a problem. So, why oats? Old fashioned. And here's uh, the nut sage, and just coming out of the parking lot, next to the wall in the parking lot, it's right out there. Uh, here it is uh, growing out of uh, a compost bin, able to survive that. And so, this is uh, here's uh, the structure. So it has rhizomes that allows to creep out into the substrate, into the soil. And it also has uh, the nutlets. Uh, the nutlets are edible. Uh, it is a cultivated plant. It was cultivated in Egypt and it was used by the Egyptians uh, of ancient Egypt as a food source. So it was very important during this time. However, it has now, it is not desirable anymore, and it has managed to go all over the world. So you will find it as a problematic plant, not just in California, but throughout the world. So if there's light and there's water, 
you will find this plant uh, are growing out there. Uh, there's going to be several others. Many of them are going to be related to the dandelion because they have seeds that have that uh, nice parachute that will allow them to disperse uh, into different areas. So this is uh, the bristle or bristly ox tongue, uh, as well as here's the common dandelion just growing underneath uh, the a fruit tree and dandelion is making a comeback. It is known that it has more vitamins, minerals, and iron than lettuce. It was used as a food uh, green uh, many years ago, and for a while it just went out of popularity. Now it's coming back. Uh, and so here it is, just organically grown out there on its own. Uh, and uh, here's uh, uh, the leaves for this individual. And here's uh, the seeds. So the seeds with the beautiful parachute is what allows this seeds to be dispersed, uh, go to different areas, and voila, you have a new dandelion plant that will come out. Uh, or there's gonna be a few that are gonna have barbs that will disperse by attaching themselves to clothing, animal fur, uh, so this is named uh, or called uh, beggar's tick because when you brush upon it, you can see the barbs on some of those uh, tips. So they're just going to stab your clothing. They're going to hang in there. Hopefully they will be dropped somewhere else where they're going to find some nice water uh, light and they're going to grow and start a new plant. So just different ways that plants are going to move around. We have a few plants that are maybe uh, in turf areas. So we have some weeds that are going to favor and prefer to grow in an open area with vegetables, some in the, with the roses, or some that are going to be very low and almost creeping that will prefer a grass uh, area. And that is because they're so low to the ground, like the turf, that they're going to survive the lawn mowing or the lawnmower. So here is a turf that is covered with white flowers from uh, the white clover. Uh, and this is, looks beautiful. It's uh, the white clover that produces the clover honey if you were to harvest it. Uh, but in most cases, when you are looking at a turf, you don't wanna see these white flowers, then it becomes a problem. And then uh, we have some of the cheese weeds or some of the mallows. Once again, in Europe, you know, in Mediterranean area, this is a food item. Uh, they we used to cook the leaves, make them into soups and stews, and as time went by, they got replaced by some other plants, and now they're just growing everywhere. So cheese weed, uh, mallows, uh, or uh, common ground so, uh, sorrel. Uh, here's uh, the flowers for this. You may encounter it here and there. Uh, or uh, here is uh, another very low-growing plant next to. On top of turf, this is uh, the black medic. Uh, so creeping, survives lawn mowing. Uh, here's the flowers. Or another plant that is going to be problematic with uh, turf is going to be English daisy. From Europe, there is sold as an ornamental, but in uh, many cases, the wild form is going to get our way. Uh, and this happens to be at the other campus, the LAC campus, where I took this photograph. Beautiful. Some people buy it, uh, and some people have it as a weed or as an unwanted plant. Uh, so English daisy, uh, as you can see here, growing on turf, can become a problem. Uh, sow thistle, and here once again, just at the edge of a park. Obviously, that's not the rightful area for it to grow. Uh, I've known many folks who love this plant for medicinal uses. Uh, and uh, I'm sure at some point or another, it may have had some of those uses and now it's just gotten away and growing in different areas. Uh, and uh, here I mentioned before uh, the prickly ox tongue, uh, which may look similar to the southeast, but as the name implies, you can see a lot of prickles uh, on some of these flowers and on the leaves and on some of those other areas. Or here is uh, uh, prickly lettuce. And yes, it is a true lettuce, like tuca cereola, uh, but it's edible like a lettuce, but 
again, out of uh, popularity. So it grows tall and uh, very easy to ID. If you look at the leaf and you look at the uh, back of the leaf, you have the main vein, you see prickles coming out from the main vein, all along the main vein. This is the only plant that does this. So sometimes those key characteristic is going to help you to ID the plants. Uh, we have several plants that fall under the common name of brass buttons. Uh, here it is just growing out in the middle next of nowhere uh, on the edge of one of those uh, either a sidewalk or one of those uh, water boxes or electrical boxes. And here's the flowers and you can see why they're called the brass buttons. Uh, and there's uh, uh, the foliage and uh, here is uh, pig's weed or uh, goose foot uh, because when you look at the leaf it kind of is flat like the foot of a goose. Uh, they are going to be problematic and many people have used them for food or they have fed them to animals uh, for fodder, uh, pigs. Uh, and so now that we don't have any of those around, now the plant still remains and it become a problem. Here it is uh, growing in Griffith Park. Uh, this is after the fire and you can see the one year growth out of this individual, it is an annual. And so as you are looking at weeds, uh, keep in mind that now in California, we have a fire season and the fire season is because of the weeds. All these plants that are non-native that grow very quickly, grow very tall, and every single year their body just lays down and it gets replaced by a new plant next year, adding to the fuel. And so every six to eight years, now we're having severe fires, uh, if not every year. Uh, but that has to do with what I like to refer to as human blunders allowing some of these plants to get away. And it was not an intention uh, or intentionally uh, allowed to escape. They just did because that's what plants do. Brought here for some useful purpose, no longer serving that purpose, but they're still here and they're not gonna go anywhere. So pig's weed, uh, or we have a hairy flea bane or flea bane uh, that is also growing right next to the parking lot. Uh, we also have filleries. This uh, will be a winter uh, geraniums type. Uh, beautiful, edible, and being used for food. Uh, uh, sometimes they're known as crane bill because here's the seeds that have this very long uh, extension. So it kind of looks like the beak of a crane or uh, a stork crane. Uh, and so this area is edible as well as the leaves. I'm sure it was uh, valuable at some point or another. Uh, and then we have different types of cress. Uh, here is a bitter cress, which is native and people call it a weed, uh, but it's just trying to make a living somewhere where it's nice and moist and a little shady. So some of the cress, which are sold as mustard greens uh, and they're very good for you to eat. Or we do have some of the plants like the thistles that might become more of a problem because of uh, prickles and spines, not just to people, but to animals as well. So in areas where there's cattle, there's uh, some farm animals, uh, when they walk through these plants, they can get really, really hurt because of these plants. Or in this case, in Griffith Park, uh, when people are gonna go hike, uh, hiking, uh, they are going to get stabbed by some of these uh, flowers. So the flowers or the base of the flower is armed with very sharp spines and barbs and a bunch of other things. So they could pose a potential hazard to people or injury to people uh, as well as to animals. So in, not just aesthetic uh, in the landscape, uh, there's also the potential for injury as well as some of these plants could also be toxic or poisonous, could potentially lead to some problems. Uh, uh, here's, uh, I think this is uh, the South Bay, so. Uh, and just here's uh, just an example uh, of uh, our 
annual bluegrass, as well as uh, a bunch of uh, weeds, uh, just an abandoned area uh, that was nice and moist that I decided to take a photograph uh, just to show a little bit of the diversity of some of the seedlings and some of the plants. And uh, here's uh, Bermuda grass uh, that was probably growing there as a turf, as a lawn, and then it got replaced uh, with some of these new lawn to garden programs. And unfortunately, the steps were not taken to eradicate the grass, and so it's coming back, and it's going to be a problem. And so here is again, the grass that was there to begin with or planted with a desirable. Uh, purpose and now no longer serving that purpose. Now the grass is an enemy and it's a weed. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, other plants, uh, ornamental plants that have gotten away. This is a uh, Arundel Tonax or the giant reed grass. If you happen to be on the west side of town, look over into the LA River. You'll see it growing on the edge of the river. Uh, it is from Europe. Uh, it is said that it managed to get here when they started sh shipping a lot of the old statues that they were finding in the Romans and uh, Greek uh, architectures and, uh, or in the ruins. Uh, and they started sending them to some of the museums into the US and California. Uh, they would use this grass as a matting to protect them. So when they got open, the, they opened the box here, they simply chuck the grass and uh, the rhizome was alive and it took hold and from there i'm sure there's uh, also escape from other areas uh it's now established in almost every waterway here in uh, california uh, so the la river is inundated with it uh, some of the other riparian or wildlife habitats it's inundated with it they're trying to stop it from going into catalina uh, and so what's the problem with that rondo? Uh, the fact that it can block waterways as well as create pools that will then be able to hold the water and uh, allow mosquitoes to thrive. Uh, and so that's a big problem. Uh, so a rondo donax, giant reed grass, ornamental, but can also be considered as a weed if it's growing in the Elia River or some of the other natural waterways. And the uh, Russian thistle, uh, tumbleweed here, uh, some of the burnt areas in Griffith Park, uh, it came out like there was no tomorrow. So it overrun every other plant. And so this is where potentially some of these plants could have a problem in natural ecosystems where they would outcompete some of the native wild annual plants and uh, they're not going to allow them to grow and that's going to become a problem plus adding to the fuel. Uh, this is the Russian thistle or tumbleweed which whenever you see some of the old movies there's always a tumbleweed that is running through the desert so the icon of the west it's a non-native invasive plant. And so when you see it tumbling through the desert, it is a way of it to disperse the seed. So as it is really literally moving through the desert being pushed by the wind, it's dropping seeds. Uh, and so that's how it disperses itself. Uh, so tumbleweed, uh, Russian thistle, uh, here's uh, the spine. So it will be prickly, be careful with it. And here's the flowers for it. So the icon of the West. Uh, and the castor bean. This happens to be one of the actually the most toxic plant in the world. Uh, the toxicity is mainly found in the seeds. Uh, castor oil, which is very good for lubricating machines, was extracted from it. So World War I, they used the product from this plant to lubricate the tanks and the war. And so it was an important actual commodity as some of the more synthetic products have started to develop now the plant has gone out of popularity and it's now established everywhere so wildlands tropical deserts you name it if there's a little bit of water it's going to be out there so here's griffith park if you you see it in some of the areas 
Uh, and as you are traveling around, look around, you find it without any problem. Yes, it does not require a lot of care. It's just uh, literally just seeds that will survive. Nothing eats them. Uh, no animal feeds on the leaves because it's too toxic. Uh, no animal will feed on the sap because it's too toxic. So you can handle it. Some people may react to it, but just be aware of that. Uh, here's the flowers uh, with the fruits uh, that uh, the seeds are going to drop to the ground and they're going to germinate within one or two days. So it is the seeds that have a lot of toxin uh, that if ingested by a human and is chewed by a human, it'll take uh, one seed to take you to the hospital and uh, possibly die uh, from it. Uh, so be careful, do not eat the seeds. Uh, and or uh, uh, black nightshade. Uh, <laughs> senior moment there. Uh, black nightshade. So here's uh, a relative sister to tomatoes. And so considered by many to be toxic. And uh, as I was learning about plants, every part of the literature said that this is toxic, this is toxic, this, uh, this plant is toxic. And then several years later, I had a student who said, no, we eat that plant in certain part of Mexico. And he literally plucked a piece of the plant and ate it. And I was like, mm, mm, it's supposed to be toxic. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> Supposedly, every part of the plant is toxic except for the ripened fruit, which is a very tiny tomato. Uh, they're sweet when they're ripened uh, and, uh, and they're safe to eat. It is in recent years that I started seeing it now being offered for sale in some of the markets as a green. So people would cook with it. Uh, I guess when you cook it, it takes away some of the toxicity, making it safe for you to eat. Uh, so, ethnicity groups, different uses by people, again, it's changing things. So here is black nightshade. Yes, it's edible. Yes, it's toxic. Just be careful with it. As far as I know, uh, you can look at it in the literature. Uh, it's only the ripened fruit that are super safe to eat. However, the rest is eaten by people. And then we have uh, a few other plants. Here's a signal hill that is inundated with uh, tree tobacco. Yes, it is a true tobacco, but do not smoke it. It is not good. Apparently, uh, here are people saying that they get a headache, not really a nicotine high. Uh, but here is a perennial plant. It gets to be a good size, the size of a tree uh, with bluish uh, white uh, Leaves and uh, tubular flowers, They're very nice. Probably brought us an ornamental at some point or another and now uh, it has uh, gotten away. Uh, it is pollinated by hummingbirds, so I guess there is some extra benefit there, but it's still a non-native plant. Uh, and, uh, and you have gigantic tree-like plants that are going to drop to the ground and uh, provide fuel for fires in the upcoming years. And you can see some more fuel right here from last year growth of uh, a different plant. Uh, so tree tobacco uh, and or poison hemlock. In history, Socrates was killed when he got uh, given a concussion made of poison hemlock. Uh, it is now scapey. Uh, poison hemlock, like its sister, carrots, uh, and the Queen Anne's Lace. So uh, I think at one point carrots may have been poisonous, but now a selection of it is kind of sweet and safe. Uh, but everybody else from its family, all the sisters tend to be not good for eating. Uh, so including poison hemlock like here, growing out of Griffith Park in some of the fire areas, it grew like there was no tomorrow and it got completely covered some of the hills with this. And so it has managed to get established in different areas as well as some worldwide, uh, you can find it. Uh, look at the stem and uh, you can see some beautiful purplish uh, spots. Uh, that is a good uh, clue that this might be poison hemlock as well as if you break the leaves, it has a, a kind of chemical stench to it or, 
uh, and then masters. Again, we are not sure how masters got established here. There's uh, some literature that says that it was used by some of the monks as they were building the missions, that they would carry mustard seeds and uh, spread them out wherever they went walking. And that is so they can find their way back to the mission. So kind of to delineate some of the roads, as well as coming uh, as seeds in some of the palms, uh, the date palms that were brought over from uh, Europe, Mediterranean, uh, into Palm Spring, that they were within the root ball. And eventually when they got planted here, the plants grew, sent out more seeds, and then they got spread out throughout California. The fact of the matter is that during the summer, entire hills are gonna be golden yellow. And that is gonna be the mustard that you see here. This is an annual plant. And one year, it'll grow taller than most of you, and it'll die by the end of the season. Uh, it's mustard. So yes, you can eat the leaf flowers, you can eat the leaves, as mustard greens, you can take the seeds, grind them up, and use them as mustard. So important for still a condiment and important for greens, but it has already escaped and is now uh, taking over some of the hills. Uh, here's the flowers, and uh, here's uh, Griffith Park. All the yellow that you see there are mustard plants that after the fire, there was a volunteer group that decided to help out and eradicate or at least try to eradicate as many as they could. And here you can see for scale, this is a simple green crew uh, removing one year growth of mustard plants that you see right there. Uh, and so I mentioned before, when you are trying to eradicate the plant, uh, you're gonna have to use an herbicide or a mechanical if you're gonna be out there with a cultivator you're gonna yeah, uh, neo pull, that's a great mechanical way, or you're gonna have to use a, uh, an herbicide. And so there's gonna be two types. The first one on top is gonna to be what is known as a contact herbicide. And the best example will be Roundup, glyphosate. I'm not promoting it, but it's gonna be one of the more popular. So here is a contact, which means you have to spray the plant. Uh, the plant will then absorb the chemical and the chemical is gonna be then translocated throughout the rhizome and uh, the roots and it'll kill the entire plant. It takes about 10 days for the plant to then go away. So you have to, the chemical has to come in contact with the green portion, the leaves of a plant, a healthy plant. So contact, you spray it on the plant. Or there's gonna be the uh, pre-emergent herbicide. Uh, so that's where you should be using for your uh, annual plants. So knowing that we're changing seasons, uh, when we get rain, before the first rain, you can apply the product, you broadcast the product, when you water it, then it creates a layer of the herbicide that will prevent any seed that would germinate from growing. So it's not gonna harm the established turf or any established plant. It will kill the plant during the seedling or the germinating stage, the very tender and fragile stage. And so you literally create a shield, chemical shield uh, on the ground that prevents the growth of a lot of those annual plants. So contact, uh, herbicide or pre-emergent herbicide uh, are gonna be two of the forms that you can use out there. All right, so that's uh, all we got for weeds. I will uh, end right now. Have a great day, bye.